This morning, we are going to continue on our uh, Family of Reboot series that we've been in, I think, for three weeks now. So we've talked about husbands, we've talked about wives, and then last week, Jordan came to you, and he talked to you about kind of the battlefield and the landscape that your kids are growing up in and kind of what's going on in their culture to kind of the, the identify the different things that you need to be aware of. Um, here's what Jordan talked about. He talked about the, uh, the family breakdown in our society, and he went into detail of what that means and how that affects your children. He went into the absence of absolutes, where he talked about how basically there is no absolute truth anymore. There is no right and wrong across the board. It's just a free-for-all for everything anymore. Um, He went into valuing only things of the temporal and how our culture is pushing our teens and our entire culture to only value the things of this life and attaining things of this life and never thinking about the future and the future life. Um, And he talked about the over-sexualization of our culture. And he talked about how that's having an impact on your teens and kind of some of the things that are happening there, okay? So that's what Jordan talked about last week. And you need to know this, parents. It is vital, absolutely vital, for you to understand the culture and the battlefield that your kids are growing up on if you hope to successfully parent them, okay? So before I go into today's topic, here's what I want to encourage you. If you were not here last week, go to our Facebook page, go online. You need to listen to the message last week from Jordan, who's our youth minister, who's on the front lines of this stuff, um, and hear kind of how he identifies these, uh, these things of the battlefield. So you're aware of what's going on, because most of you, if you're my age or older, you don't have a clue of a lot of the stuff that's happening in the culture anymore with our teenagers. Um, it has shifted dramatically even in the last about five to six years with the invention of the cell phones and the smartphones. Um, And you just need to listen to some of that so you get the battlefield that your kids are playing on. Now, this week's going to be a little different. Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about the biblical role of the parent, okay? Last week was Jordan. Is it loud out there, or is it just because I'm turned up here? Can you turn me down a little bit, John, just so that I don't blast them when I speak up louder? Because you guys know how loud I am without a mic, let alone with the mic. Um, So anyways... um, With that said, last week, Jordan laid the landscape. What I'm going to talk about this week is your specific role as a parent. Um, How does God desire for you to lead your kids, to parent your kids? What does he desire from you, and what is a biblical model of what you need to do? Um, The reason this is critical, your kids are in a war. And Jordan talked about this last week, and it's so true. Um, This culture is at war with your kids to actually be Christian, godly people. Um, And it is a fight they are going to fight every day. And you as a parent are responsible to prepare them for that war they're going to fight in so they can be successful at it. And here's the thing. If you don't prepare them properly, um, they will get ate alive. Um, They will be ate alive and they will be destroyed in this culture because this culture is fighting a full force war. And if you're not prepared and training your kids to fight in it, they are just sitting ducks out in the middle of a field. And you need to be aware of that. So for time's sake, there's a lot to cover here today. We're just jumping in, okay? And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you four areas that you as a parent must do if you are going to prepare your kids to survive, and not just survive, but actually thrive in this culture and be the people God called them to be and for you to be the parent God called you to be um, because you need to be aware of these things. So I'm going to cover four things. We're going to talk about them. A um, little background on me before we get started because I don't, this is all, always one of these you feel a little uncomfortable with, okay? Because it's easy to look at me and judge me. And look at how my kids are. They're perfect, so there's nothing to see. But if there was something there to see, you could go, well, he doesn't do that with his kids, and you'd be absolutely right. Um, I'm not perfect with my kids. I'm not the perfect dad, uh, but I strive to be every day to get better and be more who God called me to be as a father and as a parent to my children. Um, So you can always look at my kids and go, well, they're not perfectly behaved. Absolutely, they aren't. Okay, my kids are a disaster, but I'm doing the best I can. Okay, Um, but these principles hold true to all of us. If you are a grandparent in here, you need to learn these things and you need to teach these to your kids if you didn't do them with your kids. Uh, Because every parent, if you want to raise kids that will survive and thrive in this environment and this landscape they're in, you need to be doing these things as a parent. They're not optional things. They're things you must be doing. And they are different than the way you used to have to parent 30 or 40 years ago because the landscape has shifted. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is this. You must be a proactive teacher. 
If you are a parent in here, you have to be a proactive teacher. And I'm very specific on this wording. I don't just say you have to be a teacher. You have to be a proactive teacher. That means this. You must program your kids and give them the tools to be able to handle situations that are going to come up before they come up. So that when they hit those situations, they know how to process it, think through it, and make the right decisions. Okay? The way parenting has been done for most generations is this. When I notice a problem in my kid or they already receive information, then I go and talk to them about that. And then we talk and we discuss it. And I try to give them the Christian viewpoint. Okay? Let me tell you this. In our culture today, that it takes a lot more work. Um, it's going to lead to a lot worse results. And most of the time, it's going to end in a disaster because of this. We all know this. It's easier to do something right the first time and program it to run right than to have it go wrong, unprogram it, and then try to reprogram it right again. Okay? How many of your kids, if you don't have kids, how many of your kids even, how many of your kids listen to you all the time? Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, the, new, the newborn over there. Yep. There we go. Hannah, yep, she listens all the time. Um, Savannah's fine. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Um, here's the thing we know. It's hard enough for your kids to listen to you when you're not in conflict. But when you're disagreeing, are they really wanting to listen to you and take your advice? No. So if all you are is a teacher, which is I wait for my kid to find something out or my kid to be programmed by the world some way, and then when I see it and I'm unhappy with it, then I'm going to sit them down. I'm going to tell them what God's way really is. And I'm going to go, that way is wrong. Here's God's way. Here's how I need to start doing it in the future. Um, most likely you're not going to get good results. What will give you better results is this. Before my kids face certain things, I sit down with my kids. I let them know they're going to be facing these things. And I'm going to walk them through how a Christian is to respond to those things and how God tells us is how we handle these situations. Um, you will get much better results because what you do is you arm your kid. Most of us when we grew up, you just deal with things when they come up, right? That's how most of us were raised. Something comes up, you've never seen it before. Um, Jordan talked about the gun last week and how he demystified his kids. That's a lot of it is we get ourselves into things because we don't know what it is. We actually go because we want to find out as a kid. And then you get into them and who teaches you what the truth is the first time? The world. Right? And then as parents, we disagree with the world, and then we go to our kids, and we go, let's fix that, and let's do it differently. And they've already been programmed to see this is the truth, and you're just bumping heads with the truth. What you need to do is this. You need to create an environment at home where your kids are used to asking you questions, and you need to answer every one of them, okay? This can get very tiring. Trust me, if you've been around my son, this can get exhausting, Okay, um, he asks questions after question after question. I don't know if that's part of his makeup or if it's because the environment he's grown up in his entire life has always been, you ask me anything, I give you answers. Um, he will ask questions I can't answer. This is a fear a lot of parents have. My kid's going to ask me questions that I can't answer. That's okay. If you can't answer them there, you tell your kid, I'll go do the research and I'll come back and I'll talk to you tomorrow night and we'll get those answers for you. Okay, you need to create an environment where your kid goes, I'll ask my parents questions about anything because they are my teachers. They're my first line of defense. They're the first ones I go to when I don't understand something or I hear something. And then that puts you in a role to be the proactive teacher, one to program them so they're prepared. Um, let me give you an instance in my life right now. I've got a nine-year-old. He's third grade, okay? One of the tough topics we all know you have to deal with is, is the birds and the bee talk, right? Okay, that's the one most parents fear. Most guys, I'll be like, have you had that talk? Our small group, we have all have kids about the same age. Have you had that talk? And we're all like, no, we haven't had that talk. And they'll all say to me, you want to go have that talk with them? No, I don't want to have that talk with your kids. That's your job, okay? Um, nobody wants to have that talk. But here's the deal. You have to. And you have to have it before the world programs them. Let me tell you what my conversations the last two weeks have kind of been with my son. Um, because it's on TV and everything, I've asked him, Gids, do you know what sex is? And his response was, yeah, that it's like the different genders. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Yes, okay, we're not there yet. Okay. Okay. He's like, yeah, I think so. It's like guys and girls, like different genders, right? And I'm like, yeah. 
And he's like, so I understand, right? I'm like, yeah. I said, there's more there. You understand? He's like, well, what more there? Okay. Now, here's the thing. That's not something I want to approach until I have to with him, okay? You don't want to rob a kid's childhood before you have to. But I do want to be the first one who teaches him that stuff. So my response to Gideon was, Gideon, you know you can ask me anything, and I'll find you answers. And I said, on this one, you just need to wait. And I said, this is when you ask me. I said, when you hear that word with other stuff around it, and you don't understand it, and it's shocking to you, and you go, I've never heard that before. What in the world is that? I said, immediately when you hear that, you come to me, and I will share with you everything I know. And I will fill you in on all that, and I will fill you in on how God wants us to see that and what that all means. You come to me, and let me be the first one to tell you. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, that's how we'll handle it. Um, I spend countless hours with my son walking through different aspects. He'll ask me all sorts of things about school, stuff like that. I sit there, I talk to him. Here's what they are. We have a neighbor. His name is, we're going to use a cryptic name in case his parents ever attend here, but we'll call him Joe. Okay. Joe lives across the street in one house over. Um, he's same age as Gideon, attends the same school. Joe's mom is divorced and she has, I think one kid that's older than Joe then she's living with another guy, and it's at least a second or third guy I've seen there in the seven years we've been there, um, that she's living with now, and she's pregnant with him. And so he's going to have another little sibling, he's nine years old now, um, with her boyfriend that lives with them. And half the time when he's over at our house, we will say, hey, Joe, do you need to go home for dinner? And he'll be like, no, my mom was asleep when I was over there, and I'll find something later or something when I get back home. And we'll be like well, Joe, do you want some dinner? And he'll be like, no, I, my mom would be upset. And he's like, but I'll take a snack. And we're like, okay, you want some goldfish? You want? Um, I've had to, one thing you could do is you cannot address that. One thing I've had to do with Gideon, because I'm a proactive teacher as a parent, is I've sat Gideon down. I said, Gideon, let me explain to you the situation Joe's growing up in. Um, some of the reasons Joe responds the way he does. Some of the reasons Joe makes the decisions he does that really upset you. And you want to be like, Joe, I don't want Joe coming over anymore. Here's probably why, and you need to understand the situation he's grown up in, and we need to be the stable thing in his life because he doesn't have it. And you need to understand the, what you have at home and how most kids don't have that. And I've talked him through all of those things of what Joe's life is like and say, we have to be the stable thing. And here's when Joe does this, you respond this way. Uh, my son's getting to that age now where you're starting to let him go run out with the kids around the neighborhood on his own. Okay, they're trying to get that where you're like, Okay, you can take off and I'll come find you in an hour. You go do what you want to do in the neighborhood or out in the backfield. And I know the kids he's hanging out with are not Christian kids. They're not growing up in a Christian environment. So what I have to tell Gideon is, Gids, you're going to start to be hanging out with these guys. They're going to want to go do A, B, C, or D. You know you're not supposed to. Here's how you react to that. Um, you don't lecture them. You don't beat them up. You just go, hey, you know what, guys? I can't do that. I know my parents want I said, you just come back home. Do it calmly come back home and you can sit here until they come back and you know that's good he's done that three times in the last two weeks where he'll leave them and go dad we met up with a bunch of teenagers and are hanging out with teenagers and i know i'm not supposed to be with them and you told me to come home so i came home and i'm like cool okay and then the kids come back 45 minutes later i'm like hey boys if you find teenagers just walk away from them they're bad they're all bad just stay away from them okay um <laughs> Sorry, teenagers, I see you around here. Okay, uh, but just stay away from them. You don't need to be hanging out with the older kids right now. You must be a proactive teacher. You must create an environment of questioning from the time they're itty bitties. I'm doing it with my two and a half year old now. By the time she's two and a half years old, any question, and she doesn't ask any great questions, I try to answer them. So she understands there's never a, because I told you so. When you say that, you are shutting down communication with their children, and they will find another place to find their truth. So even if, you ask the same, if they ask the same question 500 times, every single time, you answer it and you walk them through it. And it gets repetitive, it gets enraging, but you need to do it because that's what God would call you to do. God does the same thing if you look at his example. God gave us the scriptures. Here's what life's going to throw at you. Here's how you handle it. You don't need to be naive to it. You don't need to not know what's coming. Here's what the world's going to do. Here's how you respond as Christians, and here's how I'm going to take care of you and how I'm going to get you out of the situations and how I'm ultimately going to prepare a home for you in heaven. That's what our Heavenly Father does for us. We need to do it for our kids, okay? The second thing as a parent you have to do is this. You have to provide them safety and stability. 
Safety and stability. Um, I'm going to read two scriptures to you to start, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more on this. But here's the two scriptures. Ephesians 6, 4, it reads, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Um, This first scripture, we see this. Dads and moms, it says fathers, but this is parents. Parents, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Meaning this, you got to be very careful of your harshness towards them. Um, physically and verbally. Physically, you need to make sure that you don't treat your kids in such a way that they get angry back at you and feel like they have to protect themselves from you. You've got to make sure you don't cross that line. Verbally, you have to make sure they're not scared of you because of the way you speak to them. That you speak to them in such harsh words that it provokes them to anger and to pull away from you because they're scared of you and go into a protection mode. Um, You have to be careful how you speak, parents, to your kids, how you physically respond to your kids. Colossians 3, it reads this, Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Um, What this one is this, be very careful with the words you use too. You got to make sure you don't mentally beat your kids up and beat them down to the point that they become discouraged and they lose self-esteem and they lose all self-worth. Because mom and dad treat me in such a way that I see no worth in myself and I feel like I'm a nobody. You've got to be very careful with the words you use. Your words mean more than anybody's to your kid, especially when they're young. Um, So choose your words very carefully. Um, Colossians is very clear on this. Now here's the thing. I say you have to provide safety and stability for your kids. You need to understand this world they live in. Um, I grew up, or didn't grow up, I did team ministry uh, for over a decade up in the Detroit area. Um, and one of the things I noticed with teens is I dealt with every type of teen. I dealt with the, the worst case where the kids that would just slice themselves all the time. Have you heard of them, the cutters before? Um, to the point that I had one girl that had them hidden in stuffed animals and stuff in her room so that the mom and dad would find some and couldn't find the others. And she had stuff hidden all over the place that she'd just cut herself. And what I found out was this, because I always struggle with what would drive a kid to doing that? Why, why would you self-mutilate yourself? And here's what I came to the conclusion. These kids today, more than any time in the past, live in a constant state of stress. Stress. I mean, heightened attention all the time. And with the family breakdown, they come home and the same thing's there, which is stress with my family, stress in the environment, and I do not feel comfortable um, in this environment that's called my home. And what they do is they put a mask on at uh, home, they put a mask on at school, they put a mask on every moment of their lives that they're awake. And if you live in an environment like that year after year after year, and especially as a teenager, is it any surprise you start to go kind of nuts? You go nuts. Try, as adults, we live through stressful times and it's hard. Try to be a teenager in your developmental years and constantly living in stress all the time where you never feel safe and stable You start to go nuts. Your role as a Christian parent, create a place that is safe, create a place that is stable, create a place that your kids come home to, they realize I don't have to put on an act, I don't have to wear a mask, and I will be loved no matter what by my family. I can come home, and this is the one place I can be who I really am, and no one's going to beat me up, no one's going to make fun of me, no one's going to beat me down. I can be who I need to be, okay? Let me give you a little glimpse into this. Your kids do goofy things sometimes at home, okay? They dance, they do things. Sometimes we think they're cute. Sometimes we look at them and we go, that's really goofy. You've got to be careful that you don't squash your spirit and let them know even as they keep growing up, you can be goofy at home and that's cool. Because we're never going to tell anyone outside of the room that you're being goofy. It's never going to leave this house. That's who you want to be and that's who you are. Fine, be it here because you can't be it anywhere else. Because if you do that at school, you're going to get lit up with criticism. Um, You're going to get persecuted. Your kids should see your home as their safety net. When everything else is falling apart around me, that's the place I can come. That's the place things are stable. That's the place things are safe. It's the place that's my rock. That's what they need to have at your house. You need to provide that for them. Third, you have to teach your kids accountability. This is one most of us are taught as parents. This is one most parents can do, but I'm going to give you the healthy way of doing it. Okay? Um, Let me read you. I'm going to read you four passages of Proverbs very quick in a row. 
to give you the significance of discipline and accountability and your parenting role that you have to do it. Um, but I'm going to then give you the specifics of how to do it in a Christian way. Here's what Proverbs says, 13, it says this, those who spare the rod of discipline, they have to do what? They hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Stop here real quick. If you don't discipline your kids because you think they're going to not like you and because that means you're a loving parent because you accept everything from them and are discipline them, according to the scriptures, that means you hate them because you're not preparing them for life. And it's going to end bad later on. Uh, Proverbs 19, it says, discipline your child or children while there is hope. Meaning usually the way I intend this, when they're younger, make sure you're disciplining them. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. Why? If they don't learn accountability and discipline when they're young, when they become adults, you will ruin their lives because their lives will be dysfunctional most likely because they were never taught discipline and accountability that they need to be functioning adults and productive in this world. Proverbs 29, to discipline your child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. How many times do we see that in culture today? Parents disgraced because of the actions of their kid. Why? They're totally undisciplined. There's, they have no accountability. Um, someone has failed them at that point. Proverbs twenty nine seventeen it says, Discipline your children. They will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. That's the ultimate goal of discipline and accountability, is you can actually have kids that make your heart glad. You look at them and go, I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of them. Okay? That is the goal. Now, let me tell you how you do this with your kids. How do you practice accountability with them? Let me give you three things. Number one is this, is you need to draw the appropriate lines for them to follow. Okay? Which means you have a black line here. You can see a line anywhere on the floor here. You need to draw a line that they clearly understand this is acceptable in our home and this is not acceptable in our home. This is acceptable in your behavior. This is non acceptable in your behavior. And I say this, I need to be appropriate. Okay? Sometimes parents give rules that aren't appropriate. You go overboard. They're not things that your kids, at whatever age they're at or whatever personality they're at, that they can follow. You need to know your child, set appropriate lines, and draw down for them so they know exactly where they are, okay? Then two is this. You have to refuse a waiver from those lines. We all see this. This is the, the cancer in our families with discipline, is the kid that has the parents that draw the line, and then they never hold them accountable, and they keep moving the line all over the place for them. Have you seen that one? You do that, you're going to get this. They do that, and you're like, well, if you do that, you're going to get that. And if you do that, well, I'm not going to punish you there, but if you do that one, and the line goes from here to that line all the way over there within five minutes, and there's never punishment or accountability to the kid, all there is is screaming at them and telling them how they're going to get punished. How many of you have seen that? Okay, see this in the store all the time. Bugs you. I do it all the time. I'm not perfect on this one. I do that. I find myself doing that. I'm like... Dude, I just moved the line on my kid like three times, and he's manipulating me right now. Um, and that's what happens. If you move the line, what you teach your kid is this, manipulation. I can do whatever I want. Mom and dad will keep moving the line. And there will never be consequences other than they yell at me a little bit. I'm cool with that, and I'll just keep pushing the line. Um, you teach your kids without thinking about that manipulation. So you draw the line. You refuse the waiver, and this is the key. You hold them accountable but without anger. Let me explain this one. Um, the reason I give you this one, my parents were excellent at this. They weren't excellent at everything. They were excellent at this one. My parents drew a line. They never wavered, and they never punished me while they were angry with me. Um, what happens is this. If you punish your kid when you're angry, you will do things and you will say things that you will regret, and you will hurt your children. Okay? Okay. Before you punish your kids, you draw a line. If they cross it, you do not waver. And then you go, there will be accountability. But if I'm hot and I'm angry at the time, I need to wait on that accountability till I calm down so I can discipline them appropriately. Okay? Now, this switches at a certain age. Because right now at the age, give you two examples. I have Liberty and I have Gideon. Two and a half year old, she does things that anger me and you have to swat her on the butt to scare her to do things because it's... Would you put your legs down because you just pooped and I'm cleaning your diaper and you're going to get it all over the carpet and you keep jumping around, smack a little bit, stop it, ooh, and it shocks her into it, okay? That's all she understands, okay? I'm angry and I'm annoyed there and I'm smacking her on the butt a little bit, but it's not a hurt pain or anything. It's enough to get her attention to go get in line, okay? Gideon's different. Gideon's at this point that you, I could, but you can't, 
In anger, you can't go off and haul off and smack my kid in the butt. In anger, I'm going to do something that I would regret. I cannot chew into him while I'm angry. I need to calm down first. Gideon knows when he's going to get punished. The reason you get punished is because you cross the line. Dad isn't going to wave run, and here's your punishment. We use spanking in my house some. Um, some of we try other things. They don't work real well. I found out taking books away or making him write letters. That hurts him a lot. Um, but spanking, let me tell you how spanking works in our house. I never spank my son when, he's, when I'm angry. Um, when I'm angry, I punish him and let him know a punishment's coming. Then I calm down, and then I will let him know spanking time's coming at some time. And then we go and we sit down and we have our spanking. What that results in is this. My kid gets in trouble. I never have my kid angry with me doing it because he knows he's getting what he deserves because he crossed the line. So when I spank my kid, I got to spank him kind of hard because he's nine years old now. He needs to feel a little pain to go, I don't want to get in trouble this way again. But he'll come in and I'll be like, okay, Gideon, today you're getting two spanks for that one. He'll be like, okay, can I take a breath for a second to get ready for this? And I'll be like, yeah, I'm like, get your, get your confidence up and all. And he'll sit, he'll sit over here and be like, he be like, and he's like, Dad, can I hold on to you when we do this? Well, I'm like, okay. And he'll come over and he'll hug me and he'll stick his butt out. And he'll like, okay, Dad, go for it. And I'll give him one smack, and then he'll collapse on the floor, and he'll be like, woo hoo hoo And that's how it kind of goes. And then he'll get up, and he'll be like, okay, I'm right for a second line. He's like, and this is our conversation last week. Is it going to be on the same cheek? I'm like, yeah, it probably needs to be on the same cheek so you get the, the, the extent of two of them. And he's like, oh, okay. But here's the deal. I tell you that for this reason. When my kid is done being spanked, he is not angry at me. He'll be out in the living room with me two minutes later after the pain wears off a little bit, hanging out with me, doing stuff, and we move on as if it never happened. There's not a strain in our relationship. There's nothing that way. I would say that is a proper form of punishment. An improper way would be this. You do something when you're angry, and your kid sees the anger in your eyes when you're disciplining them. That creates fear in your child. That creates a wall between you and your child. That creates a child that will sit in their room after being punished for hours because they don't want to be around you because they're fearful of you. And it creates days of unrest where your kid's just going, I'm scared. You must avoid that, but you must also discipline. Okay, you, you got to be consistent and you got to teach them accountability. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about this morning. Oh, let me say this. I did miss this. Um, there is this. Yes, you don't express anger. You can do this. There is a thing called positive disappointment, um, is the way I like to phrase it. Is at the same time when your kid breaks that line, does something, you can use positive disappointment, which is this. Don't worry about all the time the punishment side, but when you're doing the punishment and it's over with, the reason you let them know you're so upset isn't because you're angry. It's because you're disappointed with them. That you knew they could do better that they're better people and they're capable of so much more and they didn't reach your standard. And you let them know you're disappointed because you have such a high view of them. Okay? That, the reason I call it positive disappointment is you are teaching them, I see what you're capable of. That's positive. But at the same time, I'm disappointed in you. Um, one of the reasons I didn't get into a lot of the stuff I did as a kid that I could have, and I was a pretty bad kid, but there's a lot of lines I never crossed of the bad stuff that really could have messed my life up was because I always saw my parents' faces. We talked about this as a staff a while ago. I always saw my dad's face when I was about to do something really bad, and I could not see a heartbroken man for what I was about to do, and those things I wouldn't do. The other things, I'd be like, my dad's just going to be upset, and he's going to you know, smack my butt or something. I'd be like, okay, what's the trade-off? That's good. I could never picture my dad being disappointed where I broke his heart. And those were the things I went, I don't care how bad I want to do this one, there's just no way I'm walking away from this. Why? Because I had respect for my dad. He taught me accountability. I had respect for him. And it kept me from doing it across a lot of lines because of that. Okay? Last thing. You got to focus your kid on God's kingdom. From the age they are one years old and start talking to ever, you start teaching your kids about God's kingdom and how their purpose in this life is to serve God, not you. Um, your role is not to have your kids obedient to you. Your role is to have your kids obedient to God. And you are here in place of God right now to help them through some of the stuff. 
You teach them. You are here to win other people to Christ. You are here for larger purposes than just to attain a house and attain material possessions. You are here to work for God in this world. And you start putting that into them from the time they are young and keep them focused on it. Um, We're going to talk in a couple of weeks the role of God in your family. And the role of God in their family is this. They need to see him as another person in your family as much as they see you as one. Because he's talked about so much and his ways are talked about all the time that they start going, dad's ways are God's ways. And that's why dad tells me to do this is because God tells dad to do this. Does that make sense? You need to put it into your kids at a young age. Never see your kids as too young to start praying with. This is the best way you can start doing it. Um, Start praying with your kids every night when they go to bed um, and pray with them. Do not use a memorized prayer. Do not use the Lord's Prayer. Pray. Okay, talk to God with your kid so that they learn to have a relationship with God and talk to God with your kid. Uh, Me and my son right now, again, my son's not perfect, but I do try to implement these. Me and my son right now, I pray um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. So each night before he goes to bed, Dad prays. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Gideon prays. that He prays those nights. And it's amazing listening to the kids' prayers. Why? Because he's just heard me pray and never heard me do a memorized thing, and he just prays. And a lot of the things I've taught him over time and stuff are things he prays on. But what happens is, is he's forming a relationship with God, and he sees God as an integral part of his life. It's not just something he hears about when he comes to church. Every night with his dad, he's there and he's praying with me. I'm Liberty. She's two and a half, okay? Doesn't speak real clear yet. Um, I pray with her in autumn every single night before she goes to bed. Um, one of the funny things is the last two weeks before I pray, I say, Liberty, can I pray now? And she'll be like, no, I want to pray first. I'm like, okay, pray. And then this is what my daughter does. Two and a half year old, you can see Liberty. She just goes, dear God, dear, and you can barely hear, dear God, thank you, blah, blah. And I have no clue what she's thanking God for. Dear God, thank you, blah, blah. And she goes on for five minutes. Thank you, whispering. I don't know what she is. It could be gibberish. She'd be thank you, thanking God that I know dad's going to die tomorrow. I don't know. Um, it could be anything um, that she could be doing, but I can't hear it. But I look at it and go, she hears me every night. She says the exact same words I say getting into my prayer, and she says the exact same way out. And she hears me thank God for a lot of stuff, for the house we live in, for the food we get to eat, for all those things, um, and the church that we have, and all those things. She hears that, and she's modeling that um, already at two and a half years old to start developing a relationship with God. Um, you need to make sure you keep them kingdom focused um, because they have been given to you by God and you are to point them to their heavenly father, not just you. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you have all four of these things up on the screen. Okay. Next slide. Is that the right side or the next slide? Is the next one bring them all bold? Can you hit the next slide? Okay. Those four things. Let me give you some hope this morning. You can achieve these. You can achieve these. Um, You can accomplish these in your family, all four of those. The whole key to it is this. You've got to put the time into making it work. That's it. Anybody is capable of being a godly parent and putting these things in place in your family if you are willing to take the time to actually do it. And that's the key because these things do take time. Let me tell you, sitting and listening to my daughter whisper her prayer for five minutes is agonizing to some extent. I'm being honest with you, okay? I can be out watching the Detroit Tigers playing online, and I'd rather be out there seeing what's happening because Prince Fielder's coming up the bat, and I'm in here listening to my daughter pray for five minutes, okay? That's on the back of my mind. Trust me, okay? I know it might make me sound bad as a minister, but it's there. Um, There's things on TV I could be watching, but I need to make the time for my kids to be the father that they deserve and that God calls me to, and it takes time. All of these things anybody can do, All it is is already want to put the work and the time into being a parent God's called you to be. Okay? You can do it, and you can have kids, and you can grow up kids that survive and thrive in this culture. Now, real quick, I got to wrap up, and then we're going to dismiss here. But I need to talk on a side note real quick to those of you that are in crisis mode. Okay? There are some of you sitting in here this morning that you right now have relationships with your kids that are so dysfunctional, and they might only be 8, 9, 10 years old at this point, that you go, I don't even know how to save it at this point. It's a disaster. They don't respect me. All we do is we're in fights all the time. They do whatever they want to do. Let me talk to you for a second because there is hope for you, and your hope is not those things. That comes next. 
Um, your hope is this. You've got to reset your relationship with your kids. And you might be sitting there going, how do I reset my relationship after it's totally broken? Let me tell you how you do it. I've seen it work multiple times. I've used this in youth ministry days. I use it now when you guys come and talk to me about your kids. Here's how you reset your relationship very quickly. I'm not going to spend much time. Come talk to me afterwards if you need more understanding of this. Here's what you do. As a parent, if you're in a dysfunctional situation with your children right now, it starts with you. You have to get your relationship right with Christ, and you've got to make a commitment yourself to live the life God's called you to live. If you don't do that, just scrap it and go for whatever you want to go for. But that's where it starts if you want to start repairing this thing and get it back to a godly relationship, is you make a commitment personally to follow God's ways in your life. The second thing you do is this, develop empathy for your kid. You need to look at why your kid is doing what they do and develop empathy where you feel um, some compassion for them, not just anger towards them. Um, you need to understand most kids are the, what they've been created to be from the environment they grew up in. Not all of them, but in general, that's what it is. You need to have empathy and be able to look at their life and go, man, I can see why this kid's struggling in all these areas. And you need to take time and go, I, I need to walk through that. And I need to figure that out. And have, so that your heart softens towards them so that you can have compassion and empathy towards them, not just anger. Because you will never solve anything with anger. Okay? Third thing real quick, and this is the key. This is how you reset the whole relationship. You apologize to your kid. Now, real quick, all of our parents to some extent from time to time might say a quick apology. When I go into this, tell me if any of you had this happen to you. You get right with God. You do the next thing, you develop empathy, and then you go to them and you apologize for all the things that have happened in their life that have been bad and that you couldn't protect them from and that you might have had a hand in causing. And you sit your kid down, and it's not a time for them to apologize to you. It's not a time for them to say, I'm sorry for what they did. It's not a time for you to accuse them of anything. It's all about you and getting me for your kid and letting them know I am so sorry for the way things have gone to the point that they are today, and it's on me. Because I'm the parent and I'm the responsible one. They're not, they're the kid. And it's on me. And you take some serious time and you sit your kid down and you go through what you know from your empathy search that has led to this point of them acting out the way they are. And you apologize to them and tell them how sorry you are and that you never desired for it to turn out this way. How many of you have ever had a parent do that to you? couple of you. Did you have them do it too when you were in your teenage years, the ones that did? Or was it when they were, when you were older? Okay. That's a problem. It doesn't work when they're older. You might be able to say, you're trying to save your kid now. It's in the home. I don't care if your kid's nine years old. You sit down with them and you have this discussion. You as a parent get on your knees and you apologize to them. And you let them know how sorry you are for the circumstances they have lived through. Um, it changes everything if you do it honestly and genuinely, changes everything, resets the entire relationship. Um, kids will sit there and go, I never expected that one. I've seen dad be angry at me. I've seen a switch homes 15 times. I've seen girlfriend and boyfriends through his house. I've seen all these things. I've been on my own. I've never seen my parents come to me and apologize to me and be sorry for what they've done to me in the situation I've been put in. Never seen that. Okay, you apologize and you reset it at that point. And then from there, you have a conversation with your kid and go, here's how we're going to try to do things differently forward to try to change things and make them better. What you do is you disarm your kid's anger and you go, let's try to work together on this thing. And then you go back to the first four things that are on your program. Then you go, these are the things we're going to start trying to implement in our relationship. Your solution is not this, taking the stuff on the front and trying to put it into your thing without going through this reset thing. If you don't do the reset process, that stuff's not going to do anything. It'll cause more problems and it'll just cause kids to rebel even more. You reset it, then you go back to this. Does that make sense? If you're in crisis mode, that's your place to go. If you need more talk on that, come see me. I'll explain to you how you do some of that stuff. But I want to make sure you that are in crisis mode understand that uh, so that you can take care of that. All right? Overall, folks, we have to be the light of the world. Not as just individuals, but also as families. Your kids need to be trained to be the light of the world. And God has put them in your possession to train them, to show this world something different than what the world teaches. So go out there and do it because you're fully capable of doing it um, with God leading you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Right now, I just pray that, Lord, you would work in our lives, those of us that are our parents. Um, right now, I pray you would give us a perseverance, that you would give us a strength that we need. Um, and Lord, order, Lord, to raise our kids right. Um, Proverbs 22, 6, I missed this one, says, direct your kids in the way of the Lord, and when they're older, they will not, uh, they will not um, go away from it. Father, that's hope, that if we train them right, if we do these things and implement them, that when they're adults, they will know you and love you the way we do. And Lord, that is our prayer, that we can raise kids that way. Not kids that are looking to please us, not kids that are looking to live for us because we won't always be around and we're not people that are always, that we're wanting to please. We're not individuals that way. But you are and you always will be there. So Lord, help us point our kids to you. Help us um, develop relationships with you, with them. Um, so that they know you as the Lord and Savior as we do. Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for perseverance. I pray for encouragement uh, for those that are in completely dysfunctional situations right now that have not done it the biblical way up till now. And I pray that, Lord, you would restore those relationships, that, Lord, you would work in those situations as those parents try to reset those relationships, that, Lord, you would do something supernatural there and that you would allow them to see some fruit, some healthy fruit come out of that relationship. So, that, Lord, they may have pride in their kids and it may bring joy to their lives of the kids that they raised. Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for always being with us and giving us second chances. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.